Welcome to the Power of Purity podcast, the show that empowers men to experience their sexual gift in a healthier way. Now here's your host, Tony Ingrassia. Hey guys, welcome back to the Power of Purity podcast. I'm really glad that you could be with me today. And I am so excited about this episode of the podcast and the next episode because you guys are not going to believe the guest that I have with us today. I feel incredibly blessed that uh, he's willing to visit with us. He's an author, he's a counselor, he's a teacher. He's the founder and president of Ransomed Heart Ministries, and his name is John Eldridge. So, John, thank you so much for being with us today. God bless you. Oh, yeah. You're welcome, Tony. I'm glad to, I'm glad to have this chat. Well, I'm very honored, and I really do appreciate it. And, John, I can only imagine that many of our listeners, probably most of them, already know quite a bit about you. But why don't you take a minute in the way of introduction just to tell us a little bit about yourself? Or said another way, if there happens to be a person who's never heard of John Eldridge, doesn't know anything about John Eldridge, what would you say about yourself just to describe this guy named John Eldridge? I imagine that there's more than one person that hasn't <laughs> heard of John Eldridge. Um, I'm 57. I live in Colorado. Uh, I am a counselor by training. Uh, I'm an author by trade. I love the mountains. I love bow hunting and fly fishing and Awesome. I love the outdoor, yeah, I love the outdoors. I'm married uh, 34 years to my wife, Stacy. have three sons who are now young men, uh, grown and starting families of their own. And I'm, I'm uh, delighted to be here. Awesome. Thank you, John. Well, let me just start off say, by saying I, I want to give you a personal thank you because your books and your ministry and your message have had a significant impact on my own heart and life and healing journey. And I have no doubt that God's used your heart, your life, your ministry, your message to unleash massive amounts of destruction upon the kingdom of darkness. And I feel like you're kind of like an older brother, or this, uh, this morning I saw an image, and I don't claim to be uh, prophetic, but uh, I have this kind of odd gifting. I just see pictures or images that God gives me. And I, I don't know why, but I just thought of the, of the metaphor of a Sherpa. I feel like you're kind of an older brother for many of us in the kingdom are a Sherpa. And a Sherpa, the, they're the guys that lead people, other men, to the top of Mount Everest. Could you imagine? And Everest, could you imagine taking this journey it's unbelievably dangerous, it's precarious, it's scary, it's brutal, conditions can be treacherous, and we're called to make this journey. So, so we're like on this kingdom journey together, so God appoints certain men to be Sherpas to guide the rest of us, and I feel like in a way that's, that's your role in the kingdom, John, that you've been a Sherpa, and God's used us in that way. So on behalf of what I think would be tens of thousands of brothers, if not hundreds of thousands, if not millions of people in general, and men specifically, I want to thank you on behalf of myself and all of us who have benefited from your ministry and your contribution to our hearts and your contribution to our journeys and for leading us up Everest, man. God bless you. Thanks, Tony. I, I'm uh, I'm cracking up. I don't know that I've ever been called a Sherpa. <laughs> I like that. I'll take you up the mountain, but I'm not going to pitch your tent. For for you guys listening, you can't see John, but I can see him right now on my computer. We, we're on a video call, and he kind of has a Sherpa look going, kind of a scraggly, kind of a mountain man <laughs> kind of thing, you know. So may, maybe the metaphor works. But anyway, John, the power of purity was born out of the deepest brokenness of my own heart and life. And since the primary theme of this podcast concerns the issue of sexual purity and something that so many guys struggle with, just this issue of sex, you know, I'd like to start off by asking a few questions and just have a little 
dialogue about some sexual issues. And then because this podcast is going to publish around Father's Day, I thought maybe we could talk a little bit about the concept of fathers and fatherhood. And then, if we have time, I have an idea for just a little game that I want to play with you, if you're willing to give it a try. Sure, bet. All right. So here's my first question. He's a Christian man, yet he views pornography on a regular basis, typically in violation of his own profession of faith and even in violation of his own conscience. He knows that God doesn't want him to look at porn. He knows that it would really hurt his wife if she found out he's looking at porn. He knows he'd be in big trouble if he got caught looking at porn. He knows he's going to feel bad about it when he's done doing it. And in retrospect, he's going to wish he wouldn't have done it. And yet somehow he's powerless to resist the temptation, even though he knows all these things. So he looks at porn over and over and over again. The most recent statistics tell us that 68% of Christian men view internet porn on a regular basis. 55% of married Christian men view internet porn on a regular basis. And 50% of pastors view porn on a regular basis. So here's my question, John. It's something like this. Why does sex hold so much power in men's hearts and souls and lives? Tony, um, as you know, because you've done so much work in this area, that that <clears throat> that question has a lot of parts to it. it. It's not it's not just about sex, is it? No. Um, it you know when you when you think about um, what a man was designed for, when you think about his longing. Um, I'm just going to give you a couple categories that might be helpful to guys. You you think about a man's longing to feel powerful. I I was in the supermarket the other day and there was a little guy, I think he was like four or five years old and he had his Spider-Man pajamas on. Awesome. I just loved it because you know the story, like mom tried to get him out of those uh, before she took him to the market and he wouldn't take them off. There you you go. um, he wants to be Spider-Man. He wants to be Superman. He wants to be a hero. He wants to be amazing. Um, guys, that runs really deep in us. Yes. And you've got to look at that with a lot of compassion. Like a man, a man was made in the image of God primarily in his strength, primarily in his, built, his ability to come through. Um, you know, those fire those firefighters uh, and the rescue teams that ran up the stairs in the World Trade Center. Amazing. When everyone else was running down like that, <clears throat> that thing in men, like we want to come through. We want to, we want to feel powerful. No. Um, let me tell you where I'm, where I'm going with this. V- very few men do. We live in a, in such an emasculating world and, and there's just, most men's lives are frankly pretty disappointing. Um, they don't experience themselves as as powerful. They don't. They, I mean, they're they're a long ways from those Spider-Man pajamas. And um, and and then a, you know, let's take the case of of pornography. And for a woman to quote offer herself to a man, like wow, it touches some of those things inside, and it it makes him feel powerful. It, there's this moment of, um, for a woman, uh, let's just take pornography, for example, for, for a woman to, quote, offer herself to a man, for a man to, you know, open up a website and here's a woman just completely, <clears throat> you know, offering herself, so to speak, for a moment, for a moment, he feels alive. Yes. As, as a man. <clears throat> and it's just so important for us to understand that, it, you know, it, it, it's not just about sex. OK, right. very good. It's not just about sex. And and then and then when you add like like the addictive component into it um, and, or, and you, or you orgasms feel pretty good, right? Well, 
And those you, explosions of uh, dopamine in the brain. Oh feel. my gosh! the the whole The whole thing that's going on in your brain with the dopamine and stuff. But but what I want to say is, here's this longing to feel powerful. Um, but there's this other thing. I wanted to give you two categories: the longing to feel powerful, um, and the and the longing for some kind of medication for our pain. Uh, most men are using pornography as medication. Yes. Again, it has very little to do with sex, frankly. Right. It's, he's hurting. He's, what is it? He's lonely. He's rejected. He feels like a failure. Uh, you know, that, that pastor is serving a church that, frankly, is pretty ungrateful. Uh, petty people that are always picking on him for this, that, and the other thing. And he's just hurting. Right. He's he's hurting inside. So in the verbiage of uh, recovery, we want to trade our FB for an FG, our feel bad for a feel good. Yeah, totally. And what feels better for a few moments than the possibility of an orgasm? I mean, it's pretty intense and it feels pretty good. Yeah. And not just that. I mean, guys, let's just be honest. Eve, Eve is amazing. I mean, come on. Like. When, you know, when Adam woke up uh, and God had taken the rib from his side and and he wakes up and just think about that moment for like, here is here is a here's a woman that has no brokenness. No family has messed her up. She's not weird in any way. She's not a disaster. She's not dysfunctional. <laughs> <clears throat> Here, right? Wow. Right. Yeah. Here's this woman standing there naked in front of him, and she's like healthy and whole. And he and so Adam starts writing poetry. It's the first time in scripture when he starts doing the bone of my bone, flesh of my flesh thing. Awesome. He starts writing a Valentine's Day card, right? Right. Um, like we just need to admit Eve is amazing. Yes, she is, no doubt. And, and and she bears the image of God. Um, and I think it was William Blake, uh, the English poet, who said, the naked woman's body is too much of eternity for the eye of man to behold. Wow. Like, Eve is amazing. And so then, then you take this hurting guy who doesn't feel powerful in his world, and you put in front of him this this daughter of God, this, you know, eternal image of beauty and mercy and love. And like this yeah, man. invitation like, to ecstasy. It gets messy. Right. It gets messy. But I just think it'd be helpful for us to, I know you do this a ton on your show. It, 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 it's just helpful for us to name guys that this actually isn't really about sex. And, and let's ask, what are you medicating? What, what's your pain? Well, because you're trying to medicate something. So what's the pain? And, and why don't you feel powerful? Like why? Those two things, I think, would take a guy a long ways on his journey. Awesome. Very, very excellent, John. Thank you. Okay, how about this? I'm going to read from a book that I like. It's called Desire. It was written by this guy named John Eldridge. I'm reading from page 134. The older Christian wedding vows contain these amazing words. With my body, I thee worship. Maybe our forefathers weren't so prudish after all. Maybe they understood sex far better than we do. For us creatures of the flesh, sexual intimacy is the closest parallel we have to real worship. Even the world knows this. Why else would sexual ecstasy become the number one rival to communion with God. The best impostors succeed because they were nearly indistinguishable from what they are trying to imitate. We worship sex because we don't know how to worship God. So that last sentence there, John, is unbelievably powerful. So could you comment on that last line? We worship sex because we don't know how to worship God. (laughs) Okay. I, I am putting myself in the in the position of a listener to that. And and he's just going, what? Like, what? that is crazy. That's wacky stuff. It's more religious babble. Like, what are you talking about? I don't know. I'm not sure okay. that I, I think it might be ringing in guys' hearts more more than you think. Yeah. So let, let's unpack that a little bit. Here, here's what I meant by that. 
Um, we long for connection. We long for it. We, when you're with, when you're with somebody and, and they're telling you a story, um, don't you kind of wait for the moment that they ask you to tell you yours? <laughs> you know, when you're, when you're at a gathering or a barbecue or something, don't, don't you just wait for somebody to say, and how are you doing, Hal? You know, right. Danny, what's, go what's going on in your life? Like we, we, we long for connection. We long for, uh, for intimacy. And, Un union and, is a good yeah, man. Oh, it's huge. And, and then you, and then you start adding these layers to it. We long for love. We long for love. Like we, we, so it's are, what we were made for, right? We're ravenous for it. We're just ravenous for it. So intimacy, connection, love, and, and when you get a taste of the love of God, which is, which is not creepy, it's not broken, it's not, you know, again, kind of not messed up by your family, it's not messed up by the culture, like, like God loves really well. And when you get a taste of connection, intimacy, love with God, you begin to understand why I wrote that sentence, that there is, there is an ache in the human heart. It was Oswald Chambers who said, the only person that can fill the aching abyss of the human heart is Jesus Christ. Wow. Like our hearts, our hearts are this massive aching abyss <clears throat> and and the reason that we turn to sexual stuff connection intimacy imagination fantasy pornography prostitution whatever the reason we turn there is because it is so close it's so close to the love that god wants to give us Wow, it's really beautiful what you're saying. It makes me think of Ephesians 5. It's interesting that of all the metaphors God could use for like our union with him, our marriage to God, the bride of Christ, the church, he, he uses the sexual union, the conjugal union between a man and a woman to illustrate right. Right. who were to be with God. Yep. Like, this is the most tangible expression on planet Earth to illustrate what, what, what's happening in the kingdom between me and God. It's like, what's happening with me and this woman when I'm having sex with her? That's pretty uh, powerful. Uh, oh, yeah. He, he, I was looking at, he, he does the same thing in Romans 7, <clears throat> where he's talking about, <clears throat> he says that we might be joined to another to Jesus Christ, that we might be joined to him. Um, this, this is kind of a big idea, gang. Can we just name this? Christianity is actually not just believing in God. It, right. it, it is, you are a vine, you're, you're a branch in, in search of a vine. You are an empty vessel in search of a fountain of living water. You are made for union with God. So it's not just, yeah, I believe in God. It, it's my being, my existence, my humanity needs to be united to the life of the living God. Amen. And and that's a far, that's why the marriage thing. That's why these pictures of branch and vine, all these imagery of you're supposed to be deeply, deeply united right. with the love, the life, the intimacy, the power, the purity, the holiness of the living God. So in a mystery, it's like we're, we're deeply longing and searching for this union and this connection, totally. and we, we're groping, and we don't know how to find it with God, but we know how to have sex, and in a way, that's like a shadow of this eternal, mystical, powerful reality of the kingdom that in sex, I'm finding a kind of union and connection. It's like as close as I can come to this euphoria that I'm really seeking, the spiritual reality that I'm really seeking. Yeah, yeah. And, and, and again, just to, just to give these little tangible examples, like the human soul is made for beauty, and particularly men. Like we are wired for beauty. We respond to it. Our neurotransmitters, the, 
the, the, the, the, all of our sensory apparatus responds to beauty. And, and, and when you are not like receiving beauty from any other source, then of course, Eve is going to look like your only hope. Right. She's going to look like your only answer. Hey, you know, I, I, I can't see God. I can't touch God or taste God, but man, exactly. she's looking pretty good. Exactly. Know, I can see yeah. her and touch right. her and taste yeah. her. Yeah. Yeah. Like th- this is pretty tangible. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. yeah. It's just good to name, Tony. What we're doing is we're naming what we're looking for. And, and, and so little of it actually has to do with, with an erection. Like, you know, the things that you're naming, you're talking about union, you're talking about intimacy, you're talking about love, you're talking about feeling good. Um, like, we haven't even used the word sex. Like, cool. it's, just, it's helpful for guys to realize that. It's going to really open up the categories. Right. Wow. For hopefulness, right? It's going to open up the categories for breakthrough and healing and relief because um, – I know we're jumping, to, you know, kind of towards the answers, but like all that stuff's available, guys. Praise God. Love's available. Beauty's available. Intimacy's available. Feeling powerful is available. Uh, having something, having something speak to your pain, that's available. Praise like that's God. all. That's all available. Right. And that's the hope. Then you go, oh well, then maybe I can get free of this thing. Praise God. Yeah. Okay, John, that's awesome. This is so good, you guys. It's so good. I hope you're just getting blessed by this. Well, John, I, I've read most of your books. I've listened to a whole bunch of your teachings, your seminars, your conferences, your DVDs. And if I had to pick one concept at the very epicenter of John Eldridge, your ministry, your teaching, if I had to boil it down to one common denominator, I'm going to take a guess, okay? Do you want a a drum roll? It's the concept of the centrality of the heart. Above all else, Proverbs 4.23, guard your heart for out of it are the issues of life. And what I think this means is that if a man's having a problem or a struggle with internet porn or compulsive masturbation, adultery, strip clubs, cyber sex, or however he's acting out, that his problem isn't really internet porn or compulsive masturbation or adultery or strip clubs or cyber sex or however he's acting out, but his real problem is with his heart. And therefore, I want to ask a question something like this. What needs to happen in a man's heart that will allow him to be truly set free from the old person he used to be so he can become the new person that God intends for him to be? That is the $6 million question. That's it. You've nailed it. That, thank you for taking us there. You're a good student, by the way. As you were, as you were preparing to boil down uh, you know, something like 15 books and, and you know, uh, 20 years of teaching into one principle, I was really waiting to hear what you're going to say. Did I get did I get it pretty good? You nailed it. That's awesome. it. The heart is central, guys. And 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 again, you know, we hear that, and part of us winces and goes, "Oh yeah, it's you know, it's my bad heart." And um, I got some phenomenal news for you. When Jesus Christ enters the human heart, He makes it good. Uh, the Scripture doesn't teach that you have a bad heart after you give your life to Christ. Um, because there's no way, there's no way of winning the war from the outside. You have to win the war from the inside. Yes. And God, God knew that. He knew the law, <clears throat> the regulations, the rules, the pressures. He knew that that wouldn't do it. And the reason it wouldn't do it um, is because you have to change the human heart. Yes. And so the promise, I don't know that some guys have even heard this, so I'm going to give a quick presentation of the gospel. But the promise is... Um, first he gives it in Ezekiel. He says, a new heart I will give you, a new spirit I will put within you. I'm going to take away your old heart. I'm going to give you a new heart. And then, um, like in Romans 2, Paul is talking about who is a true follower of God. Um, It's not a Jew outwardly. 
he said it's the person whose heart has been circumcised to God. Like God transforms the human heart. And, and even Jesus in, in uh, the parable of the sower and the seed, he says that the seed that fell on good soil stands for those with a noble and good heart. And so you, you've got to begin with the understanding that God can change your heart. Amen. He, he can give you a new heart. And, and if you are a believer, if you have opened your life to Jesus Christ, he has given you a new heart. Now, you know, that doesn't just make everything go away, you know, with the wave of a wand, but you've got to be able to start there and go, wait a second. You know, I, <clears throat> I'm in the store the other day, the, the checker who, who's, uh, I'm in the grocery line. I got the checker who's the cute little girl that chose not to wear a bra today, you know, Great. and, and, and everything, you know, your initial reaction is, whoa, you know, because Adam's reaction to Eve was, whoa, you know, <clears throat> But then the next moment to be able to remind myself, you know what, I, I actually, I actually don't want you. I really actually don't. I, I am, I have a new heart. My heart is good. And, and I don't need to run with this. I don't need to kind of chase down the fantasy trail here. I can look at you and go, you're beautiful, but I don't need you. And I don't want you. I don't lust after you. I don't covet you. I don't need Praise to. Praise God. Yeah. And, and, and so that, it's it's the new heart on the inside that's going to empower me to be the new man on the outside. That's going to empower me to make better decisions and <clears throat> and uh, to control my eyes, what I'm looking at, and what yeah. I'm cho- yeah yeah. It's absolutely huge, guys. Because because if you're still in the doctrine or the theology, the belief that your heart is evil, how are you ever going to win the internal war? You, you just keep what, what men try and do is, OK, so I have to kill my soul. I have to kill desire. I've got to shut down all of this passion inside so that I can behave myself. And I'm, I'm just telling you that that doesn't go well. Um, those desires don't go away. They go underground. Right. And then they come out later. You know, and some something that's going to take you out. So that like was a vol- the- like a volcano, the pressure builds, and sooner or later something's going to erupt. Yeah. So that's step one. You asked what needs to happen to that to the heart uh, for a man to be set free. Step one is you need a new heart. You need you need to give Jesus Christ your heart. You do it. You, need, you really need to do that. Um, and then um, we probably get into this in the second second part of this uh, two-part series, but you have a wounded heart, guys. You, you have a wounded heart. David, you know, the mighty warrior who who just was a phenomenal guy in combat, brave, amazing. You know, you read his Psalms and he says things like, Lord, be merciful because my heart is wounded within me. Um, you have a wounded heart and your wounded heart is causing you to seek relief. Now, Jesus Christ is really great at healing wounded hearts. He, he's am- he's amazing at it. But you you, you got to you got to give him access. You you can't ignore those wounds and then hope to live uh, a whole life, a, a holy life. You can't a life of integrity. You can't ignore your wounded heart. And so that's, you know, step 2 is, well, what are you doing with your wounded heart? So like we've a, got we've got work to do. Yeah, we've got, we do. We've got business to do with, in a sense, our story, our past, our pain, our hurts. Our, Big time. Big time. And it's so hopeful. It's so hopeful of all the passages in Scripture that Jesus could have chosen to announce his ministry. In Luke chapter four. Yes. Awesome. He, he quotes Isaiah 61 and he says, I'm, I'm here to heal your wounded heart. Right. And I want to set you free from darkness. Praise and God. I, it's, it's huge, guys, because there's a, you know, we start we start giving our wounded heart over to things. And it, and it might be it might be success. It, it might be the praise of people. It, it might be alcohol, cocaine, meth. It might be porn. Um, you know, guys kind of choose their medication, but you're giving your wounded heart over to these things. And and if you'll give your wounded heart to Jesus. He can heal those wounds. And the amazing, 
the amazing thing is, is you find yourself going, you know what? I don't need my medication anymore. I'm, I'm actually okay inside. Awesome. Praise be to God. That's awesome, John. So last night, um, you know, I, I mentioned sometimes I see pictures and I, I, I just believe that God works through dreams and I have these dreams sometimes. And I don't know if it was in preparation of this interview or what, but I had this thing come to me last night and I woke up with it and I, I almost didn't quite understand it at first. So I thought about it. I just want to run it by you. Okay. So the idea was this, the, the thought that came to me, men are using sex in the same way that kids use cutting. You know, when kids cut with a knife or razor blade and, and to see the blood, they cut, I understand, essentially because their heart and their soul is numb. In, in your verbiage, uh, they've lost their heart. They can't feel, okay? So they want desperately to feel something. And given the choice, I'd rather feel pain than feel nothing. So I'm going to cut myself with this knife or this razor blade. I'm going to watch the blood come out, and at least I'll be able to feel something. So in much the same way, could it be that because of this loss of heart that we're discussing, or said another way, because I've become so detached from my own heart, I've lost the ability to be truly alive. I've lost the ability to truly feel I've lost the ability to experience life the way God intended for me to experience life. And therefore, as a man, I'm almost desperate to feel something, to feel anything. So, yeah. so I'm going to be inclined to reach for the thing or to grasp the thing that has the greatest potential to infuse within me a kind of shock or a jolt or this massive, intense sensation and feeling so I can feel. And in a sense, what feels more intense, what delivers a bigger jolt, what provides more sensation and feeling for the average man than his orgasm? And so this idea, could it be that men are using sex in the same way that kids are cutting themselves because of this loss of heart, they're desperate to feel, and sex makes me feel something? Yeah, Paul says, um, and having lost all sensitivity, they have given themselves over to sensuality. Yes. Yeah. That's so, so excellent, because if I was going to put a proof text there, it'd be Romans 1, and you're quoting it, man. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's um, again, it's good news, guys, like, like to hear Tony describe that, the good news is... Um, you're you're aching to feel. You are aching to feel alive. You you, and and I, yeah. John ten. Jesus says, "I've come that you may have life, and have it abundantly." Like God loves to give us life. He's all about life. Like look at the world. Look, I mean, the world is just brimming with life. Like there's more life in one drop of pond water. Then you can then you can find in a microscope. I mean, the world is filled with the life of God. So, yep, that's what's going on. I want to feel alive. So, with that being said, you guys, I hate to do it, but I need to jump in at this point and bring this episode of the Power of Purity podcast to a conclusion because I see from the clock on the wall that we're out of time for this episode. So I really hope you're able to come back next week as we continue part two of our interview with the founder and president of Ransom Heart Ministries, John Eldridge. It's going to be awesome, you guys. So I'll look forward to seeing you next week. God bless you and have an awesome day. Thanks for listening. Visit powerofpurity.org for more resources and information. And if this podcast has been helpful or encouraging, please invite a friend to listen. Until next time, remember, there's power in purity.